Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What a blessing it is to be in Bible study one more time. What a joy it is to greet you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I think we are on in all of the places that we should uh, be on in, and we're grateful to God uh, for for that. Amen. I want to certainly uh, thank you for joining in with us today. Uh, we want to be certain that you know uh, that we appreciate um, all that you do uh, to be a part of our study. We know that it is not... Um, It is not always at the most convenient time for everybody, uh, but we do want to uh, be certain that we're, we are um, capturing those who are able to be a part of our study at this time. We thank God for um, the fact that it is the month of November. Uh, we know that it, it really, uh, November has snuck up on us. We are almost ready for New Year's Eve service, and it feels like we just had a New Year's Eve service, uh, so we are we are thanking God for for that, and truly He has been uh, very good to us. In fact, He's been better to us than we could really be to ourselves, and so we are we are grateful to Him. We are grateful to Him uh, for that. Now, we want to uh, certainly say to you uh, welcome, and uh, we look forward to. Uh, having you as a part of our study. If this is your first time joining us, uh, we uh, say welcome to the Purity, hashtag Purity Virtual uh, Bible Study family. We want to uh, thank you for uh, tuning in and uh, being with us today. We are at this point uh, going to get ourselves moving. Uh, we're going to begin with prayer and then we will uh, move forward in our, in our study. Amen. Most holy, all wise, eternal God, our Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be in your presence. We thank you, God, for how you have blessed us and brought us to this very present moment. And now, God, we pray that you would be with us during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have, for the last um, several weeks, actually, uh, been in this series on um, the, the portrayal of Christ in the Gospel of John, and we have, if you will note, have gone uh, chapter by chapter, so uh, we're in our fourth chapter, which means we're in our uh, fourth week of study, and so we have, in, in some way, we're trying to uh, stay sort of in tune with where we are, so this is our fourth lesson uh, in this particular series, and we are uh, moving in that way with our um, with our lesson. Now we want to this week uh, go to John chapter 4 and uh, the, the whole chapter verses 1 through 42 really need to be read in your uh, quiet time. But for our study uh, this morning I want to read just um, two verses. John chapter 4 verses uh, 6 and 7. Now Jacob's well was there Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. I'd like for you to think with me for a little while on the lesson topic, a meeting with the master, a meeting with the master. And again, this lesson continues in our series on the portrayal of Christ in John. One of the significant features of Jesus's ministry and one that we take note of in our lesson was his meetings with people. Leonard Griffith examined many of these encounters in his book, Encounters with Christ, 
the personal ministry of Jesus. And uh, just as last week's book, I have this book as well in my library. Griffith emphasized Jesus' interest in individuals. The Lord was not so preoccupied with the multitudes that he lost concern for individuals. There is a rich and bold statement just made in that because sometimes in our attempt to be greater than we may see ourselves at some point, we forget the benefit of serving the individual. I consider myself uh, by nature a transformational leader. That's the kind of leadership model that I practice. But there is also the idea that in the church, you must also practice a servant leadership model. And a part of the servant leadership model is that you uh, work with the individual and that you take time out with individuals as much as or even more so than the multitude or the crowd. Because what must be understood is, though there may be a crowd or an individual, we could never get so caught up in the crowd that we forget that there are individual needs and individual concerns in them. As a pastor, I have uh, very willingly uh, spent time in places and with spa in spaces with persons and others that that may others may not have thought or deemed uh, plausible to do, but my responsibility as a pastor, uh, though I care for the entire flock, is to ensure that even the one um, has suitable um, concern and attention. Now, the the one doesn't get to decide that. Uh, but the Christ in me gets to decide how that attention and that concern is is delivered. Yet, uh, it must happen. And I don't ever want to become so concerned with the multitude uh, that I forget um, that those who make up the multitude and those who make up the crowd, and especially those who have been supportive and there uh, through the time where there was no multitude or times where the multitude walked away and they still remain. And so that, that those things are important. Jesus met with many people. One of his most significant meetings was a sinful woman at Jacob's well. Let us examine some fascinating facets of this famous interview. We're going to look at some things that happened in this meeting, this interview, this time of interaction between Jesus and one woman that caused life-changing things to happen. First, we look at the perplexing problems, the perplexing problems. Jesus's meeting with the woman at Samaria was full of problems. To understand the difficulties, one must understand some geography and history of Israel. The pious Jew would not go through the land of Samaria. Following the northern kingdom of Israel's captivity in 722 B.C. by the Assyrians, the land was inhabited by Israelites and foreigners. They intermarried, which was repulsive to pious Jews, and therefore the pious Jews avoided Samaria. Regarding Jesus, John said he had to go through Samaria. John chapter 4, verse 4 in the NIV version, various barriers existed for Jesus and the woman, and yet Jesus had to go through Samaria. There was something in his work, something in his ministry that caused him to have to go through the place where it was deemed uh, not appropriate for him to do where the barriers were there, where there were things that, that caused them not to naturally interact. But Jesus did not allow those barriers to stop him from doing the work that he was sent to do. The first barrier was an ethnic barrier. Jews were somewhat tolerant of other races, but the Samaritans were contemptible to the Jews. When the woman met the Lord, she emphasized this barrier. This is what she said in verse 9 of John chapter 4. How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, a woman of Samaria? 
How are you going to ask me for a drink? This woman says, how is it that you want to, to, to deal with me? I am a, a woman of Samaria. You are a Jew. So she understood that barrier and she brought it to his attention right away. Right away. She brought the ethnic barrier up. And sometimes we allow ethnic barriers to stop us from serving and from doing the will of God. Sometimes we uh, 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 distance ourselves from certain ethnicities and, and we find ourselves somehow not serving as we could. And though there may be a passion or a desire to serve a certain group, uh, that does not mean that we eliminate others who are also a part of what we are dealing with. The next barrier after the ethnic barrier was the gender barrier. Rabbis were forbidden to greet women in public, but Jesus crossed that barrier. Not only did the Lord cross the barrier, but he chose to talk with a notoriously immoral woman. So he didn't just cross the barrier, the gender barrier, but he crossed it with someone who had other things, other other issues underlying that caused her not just to, not the barrier just to be gender, but there was some immorality and there was some understanding there. And sometimes we forget because we get too high in ourselves and we think that because we have somehow uh, come to a place where we at least look holy and at least look saved, that now we can judge and look down on others who may have uh, more visible immorality. But the point of the matter that I'm trying to make is this. All of us have something that we have to, uh, that we would not want to be uh, displayed before Jesus. All of us have something that has caused us to somehow fall short of the glory of God, to sin, to, 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 to find ourselves outside of the ark of safety, outside of the mark that we ought to make as it is, as transgression indicates. And so because of that, none of us have the right to look down or judge anyone, but only time we should look even in that general direction of, 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 of saying ourselves, look at that, is to help somebody else to get up. Otherwise, we should never look down on anyone. And so Jesus said, not only am I going to cross gender barrier, but, but there's going to be uh, uh, more than that that I'm going to cross. And then there was the religious barrier. The religious barrier. So there were three barriers. Ethnic barrier, the gender barrier, and now the religious barrier. There was a wide religious gap between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans worshipped at Mount Ebal, and the Jews worshipped at Mount Jezerim. And so there, 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 there were barriers. They didn't even worship in the same place. They didn't even worship together, and, and they didn't have the same respect or review of one another. But Jesus allowed none of those barriers to hinder him in the work of ministry. He allowed none of those barriers to stop him from being all that God wanted him to be. And he just, he continued to move forward and do what God would have him to do. Lakasha, I see you. Amen. God bless you. The next, uh, the next, I see you on our uh, live. I'm, I'm, that's what I mean to indicate. The next thing that we are looking at is the master's proposal. The master's proposal. So we have the perplexing problem. Now let's look at the proposal, the master's proposal. Jesus had the interpersonal skills to overcome the barriers. Let us follow the strategy of the master in how he made the meeting with the woman meaningful. You see, he used what we consider interpersonal skills to not allow to, to navigate or walk through barriers. And if we would look at them, look at his skillfulness, it will help us also to reach out and to do things in the proper fashion. Jesus asked her first for a common necessity. John chapter four, verses seven through nine. When the woman came to the well, he asked for a drink. Jesus was thirsty and the woman was thirsty. Even though they were different in race, gender, and religion, they had a common need for a drink. So, so, so that's the first thing that we see. There was a common need. 
And often when we are developing conversations, we're trying to develop relationships. We're trying to get to know. We're trying to interact or find a way to interact. It is by looking at what might be common among us, especially if it is a need. And so, most of the time, needs will draw us together. Have you ever noticed how maybe you're sitting in the emergency room or sitting in some place where you're waiting for something and everybody's waiting for the same thing and you begin to build camaraderie there because everybody has a need and everybody has that same need and they can at least establish if we don't have anything else in common, we have this same need in common. And so we began to talk to one another and deal with one another and strive to be uh, what God would have us to be together or at least we find some uh, uh, pleasure or some help in uh, commiserating together, even if it's it, even if it's just that. But there is some way that we become united by our need. Jesus aroused the woman's curiosity, John chapter four verses ten through fifteen. And I didn't read all of these verses initially, but I'm referring to them so that you can go back and read them. After he talked about his and her physical thirst. He mentioned something about the living water. Immediately the woman began to ask questions. From whence then hast thou this living water? The woman realized that Jesus was speaking about another type of water. So he used what was common and what she understood to intrigue her about what now she needed to understand and the next place that she needed to go. And sometimes when we are witnessing to people, when we are trying to help people to come to Christ, when we are trying to help people to see Jesus in a new way, sometimes we have to use what is common to help them to see uncommon or things that they may not understand in the way that, they were, that we might understand them. But we have to relate them. We have to make it relatable so that they will get a clear picture of what we are trying to say to them. And so Jesus used the water to tell her there was a, a, a greater water. The scripture indicates a living water. She immediately picked up on the difference and wanted to know more about this living water. Jesus awakened the woman's conscience in verses 16 through 25. The woman did not grasp everything about the living water. So Jesus appealed to her conscience. Go call thy husband. And come hither. Now, now, now he she she he 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 moved from the common and 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 tried to be relatable. Now he appealed to her conscience, her, her because because regardless to what it is, uh, there are times where our uh, where what we are dealing with has to be pointed out, has to be dealt with. Jesus is not yes he's all loving, yes he's wonderful, he's kind, he accepts us as we are but he also comes to help us to become better. And the only way for him to help us to become better is to point out for us our weaknesses. Now, the wonderful thing about this is that when he pointed out her weaknesses, one thing, he pointed out to her and not everybody around her. But the next thing is because there was nobody there. It was in the middle of the day. That's why she was coming at that time. But she didn't want to deal with, she knew who she was and what was going on. And she didn't want to deal with the, the idle uh, 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 water hole chat. She didn't want to deal with that. Jesus knew that he wasn't going to embarrass her, so he dealt with the situation. Because there was nobody around, and he could talk directly to her. And please note that Jesus is not just there to, um, to make you, you know, to, he will certainly embrace you. And, 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 and let you know that all will be well, but he's also there to help you to find correction and to find new strength and a better direction and course correct in what he's dealing with. So he said to her, go call thy husband. Jesus wanted the woman to see that he knew the errors in her life. With her conscience awakened, the woman wanted to talk about her relationship with God. She said, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place to worship. So now he has awakened and he has taken her back now. That, that, in, that the awakening of her conscience has taken her back to her relationship with God. She may not be moving forward in it, but she has a starting point. And for most of us, 
There ought to be that moment, or there often is that moment, where we are drawn back to those initial places and those initial steps, those initial experiences that we have had in our relationship with God. She immediately went back to worship. She immediately went back uh, to the understanding that, 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 that worship is important, but also she understood that Jesus was a prophet, or at least that was part of his reality. She was partially true, prophet, priest, and king. And so sometimes in our conversation, there are things that will touch someone and the way they are said, that's why you have to ask the Lord to guide you in those conversations because what he will do is allow your words to touch someone in a way that points them back to the place where they have experienced God in a real sense. And it is from that point that you begin to build a bridge to this new opportunity to first, be forgiven of all that has happened, but two, to move forward in a greater and more deep relationship with him. Jesus acknowledged himself as the Messiah. John chapter 4, verse 26. Skillfully and masterfully, Jesus led the woman to the fact that he was the Messiah. At the appropriate moment, he made the messianic disclosure. I am who I am. And I who speak to you am he. I who speak to you am he. In essence, now he has moved her from simply water, their need, their common need for, for something to drink, to the fact that she is now speaking to the Messiah. He skillfully navigated that conversation to bring her to that understanding. We as believers in Christ sometimes overlook even those small interactions and small conversations that we have with others, even an invitation to something. I, I think about this past Sunday, we had our family and friends day and our choir day, and there were many who invited. I, uh, Lakasha's on here. She invited. She worked hard to get family and everyone here. And this is the place where um, many of us began, and there were other families here, Deaconess Emerson and others who invited other Deacon Grayson and uh, so many people I invited as many people as I could invite uh, but but we so there were there were all of us inviting but we did it in a way that was non-intrusive non-threatening but we wanted them to understand that there would be something deeper or, or or something more that they could receive by coming to the worship experience and I of course I can't I didn't call the names of everybody who invited someone but 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 I know that there were many who did it but we all do it not because we want them to see us, but simply because we want them to get to meet the Christ who we are speaking of. And we know that there, there are places, just like she talked about this mountain where worship is. Jesus said, listen, you don't have to worry about that. God is a spirit. They that worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so, so, so he wanted them to see that this it was more about the connection. And that's what we are striving to do. Make sure that people are at least given the opportunity to connect. Now, the, the, the final thing that we see is the woman's proclamation. The woman's proclamation. After the interview with Jesus, the woman left for the city of Samaria. She told the people about the Lord. Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is, this, is not this the Christ? John chapter 4, verse 29. From a common need, he has taken a woman who, you know, had some difficulties in her past, had a checkered past, as I, as I often say. And now she has become an evangelist, an evangelist and a missionary. All because of a true encounter with Jesus, simply because he did not, he was concerned about the individual at a time where others may have only focused on the multitude. See, we make changes. We, 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 we see Christ uh, deal with us, minister to us one by one on an individual basis. The woman's proclamation. After the interview with Jesus, 
the woman left for the city of Samaria. She told the people about the Lord. Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? The woman had been changed because of her encounter with Christ. A careful study of her attitude and actions reflects a radical change in character. The woman also had a new concern for her life. She left the water pots and went into the city. Her primary concerns had been the sensual things of life. After her life-transforming experience, she was concerned with the spiritual condition of an entire village. You see how through that encounter, one need and one thing uh, changed. Her new, she had a new concern. She had a new desire, a new thing that she wanted to see done, a new thirst, if you will. Her new thirst was now, now if he could help my spiritual condition, and if he could help me when others have talked about me, and if others have looked down on me and have said that I am not going to, not much or not going to make it or not going to be able to, and yet he took the time to talk to me, to cross all of those barriers, to break those rules, to talk to me, then I want others to also experience this Christ that, that, that has dealt with me. And he dealt with me in my most vulnerable place. He pointed it out directly, but he handled it with such care that I knew that he loved me and that he was able to help me to see things differently. And notice that he didn't say to her, thy sins are forgiven, this, that, or the other, but he simply helped her to see her life differently. And she made the decision to go and tell the rest of the village. Come and see a man who's told me everything. My question to you as we leave this time of study, why don't you have a meeting with the master? Let him tell you about his character and his ability to change people. Let him work on your heart, your mind, your your disposition, your thoughts, and all that you're dealing with, let him work on you in a way that causes you to feel and to know that you can receive him in a, in a, in a brand new kind of experience. I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't want the Lord to ever, I don't want to not engage any moment that Jesus wants to speak to me directly. And I'm never offended or upset by Jesus pointing out my faults because I know I have them. And then the wonderful thing about him pointing them out is he's going to help me to be better. And so that's what I appreciate most about him. He can do it. He is able to do it. He is able to do it. Will you trust him to do it for you today? Will, he tr will you trust him to use you as a conduit to help somebody else see Christ and experience him in a real way? Will you trust him that he can that he can go into those intricate places of your life that may cause some hurt and concern and, 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 and build up in you someone new, something new? Will you trust him? Will you trust him? This has been our Bible study for the morning and we are grateful to God for this lesson a meeting with the master i pray that we all find ourselves in a place where we're having a meeting with the master join us this sunday here at purity we are looking forward to our annual uh, our monthly uh, communion service we certainly celebrate communion on the first sunday and we're looking forward to you sharing with us uh, in communion uh, this month is a busy month uh, this month does encompass uh, a special day uh, for Purity and I, 
uh, because it's our anniversary. Amen. It's my 14th anniversary as pastor, but it's really our anniversary because we are pastor and people. It celebrates when we were united together. Uh, though I come out of purity, uh, we still had to have that opportunity for uh, us to uh, unite as pastor and people uh, for the work ahead of us. And so we're going to celebrate uh, the 14th uh, milestone of that relationship. And I'm just thanking God for that privilege and opportunity. And I hope that you'll be able to celebrate with us uh, in that opportunity. Certainly you can uh, be kind to me and I appreciate that. But even if you're not able to uh, to do any of the things that may be able to do, you're not able to uh, have your presence there or whatever other things are maybe standing in the way, if you would pray for us. And not just for that day, but pray that we would continue to be fruitful in our work and that the relationship between pastor and people would continue to grow and blossom and remain healthy as God would have it to remain. And I know God will bless us and move us in the right direction. May God bless you. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for the opportunities that we have had to be in your presence. Now, Father, we need you to guide us as we go out from this time of study so that we can truly find ourselves having that meeting with you. We want to meet you in a new way. We want to meet you and only you, God. We thank you for this month of November, and we pray that as we go into it, Father, as we begin this month, and we've begun it with Bible study, that we begin, that we see you moving in us in a new way. Help us to forget those challenges that have been uh, throughout the other months and in our past, and let us use this first day of November to start afresh and anew, to remember the places where we have worshipped. To remember that you must be worshipped in truth. And to allow ourselves to be changed and to walk in that direction. We ask these and all the needful blessings in thy son Jesus' name. Amen. God be with you.